Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's event at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, uh, COVID-19 Tracking East Asia's Response in Year One. My name is Kok Ho, and I'll be your moderator for the event. Um, today's event is to look back at the first year of living with COVID-19 in Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and South Korea. We are interested to look at what these governments have done, <coughs> um, what we have learned, and what we might do differently. The event is organized by the Social Inclusion Project, a new research unit at the LKY School, uh, which analyzes the role of public policies in creating open, diverse, and inclusive societies. Um, SIP, for short, uh, conducts research, uh, produces knowledge resources, and also does outreach and public engagement. And we have several ongoing projects looking at the impact of COVID-19 on households in poverty, on homelessness, and on the gig economy. We're also here this evening to launch a new policy tracker uh, the name of the tracker is COVID-19 Policy Response in East Asia. This will be a freely accessible policy tracker at the school website. Um, a team of researchers have been collecting and reviewing information from a range of official sources in their original language since 2020. And using the information, uh, we've built a database of uh, case counts and policy descriptions which are then rendered as visualizations on a customizable uh, interface. Um, we categorize the policy interventions into eight policy domains, health, travel, closure, businesses, individuals, education, social service, and others. And within these eight policy domains, more than 70 policy types. So this will enable us to do kind of fine grain comparisons of uh, what governments have done in response to COVID-19. This tracker is a resource for researchers, students, uh, the public, anyone interested to understand policy making during this pandemic. Uh, the program for the rest of the evening is as such. Uh, we'll begin with uh, remarks from Professor Kong Yun Fong, and then we'll have demonstrations of the tracker by three researchers. And then we'll hear from our two panelists, uh, Professor Donald Lowe, and Professor Alfred Wu. And after that, we should have some time for questions. So first up is uh, Professor Kong Yun Fong. Yun Fong is Li ka Professor in Political Science at the school. He's of course a towering figure in international relations uh, with research interests in the United States, uh, foreign policy, international relations of the Asia Pacific, and cognitive approaches to international relations. His bio is too long to read in full, so I'll leave you to explore that. Best for me now to hand the time over to Yun Fong. Yun Fong, please. Thank you very much, Kok Ho. It is a real pleasure to welcome all of you to this uh, panel discussion and launch of the policy tracker, uh, COVID-19, Tracking East Asia's Response in Year One. Now, many of you here I think most of you here might not have seen as much of us on TV as you might have seen the handsome dean of the School of Public Health, who almost on a daily basis has been guiding the nation through the stresses and strains of the pandemic. But we at the LKY School have also been hard at work in analyzing the governmental and societal responses to the pandemic as part of our effort in a way that Kok Ho just uh, said, to learn about best practices on dealing with the current and future pandemics. At last count, we have published over 100 op-eds, seven journal articles, 10 working papers, and the faculty and researchers of the school have given 38 interviews uh, on the topic. And of course, uh, Kok Ho and his team's tracker is one of the most impressive and enduring of uh, these efforts. There are many policy trackers out there for those of you who have cared you know, uh, to look for them. And uh, they look at various dimensions of the COVID-19 pandemic. The LKY SPP tracker is unique in focusing on South Korea Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore. Uh, it allows us to show key metrics on the severity of COVID-19 
including daily and cumulative cases uh, and deaths. Now, alongside the timing of policy interventions with concise policy descriptions, this makes it especially suitable for doing fine-grained comparisons of policy approaches relative to the public health situation, both across policy domains and between the four entities. So Koko and his team selected these four little dragons or the four Asian tigers, as they were known in the 1990s, principally because of the long-standing theoretical interest in governance among developmental states and East Asian social welfare policies. Now, since the start of COVID-19, there has been renewed interest to compare these cases with reference to their historical contexts, their bureaucratic cultures and social policy regimes. So this tracker provides a rich base of data for researchers and others to learn about and to compare their policy responses to COVID-19 in a detailed and empirical manner. It is truly an impressive and useful tool. And I hope uh, you will agree as you uh, listen to the discussion uh, later uh, you know, in the program. And so we have assembled a superb cast this afternoon uh, to enlighten us on the matter. In addition to Kok Ho, who will be chairing the session, we are fortunate really to have with us professors Donald Lowe and Alfred Wu, who have been studying public policy responses to COVID-19 in the region. And three young researchers, Yilok, uh, Soyang, and Monesh, all of whom are MPP graduates of the school and who helped develop the tracker. Today's seminar and the tracker, I have no doubt, will add to our ongoing conversation about Singapore's public policies from a comparative perspective and in an Asian context. On that note, I will hand over the proceedings uh, to Kok Ho. Over to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Yin Fong, uh, for the encouragement and kind words. Uh, we next move on to uh, three demonstrations uh, of the tracker, uh, drawing out different dimensions of public policy responses to COVID-19 in the four places, as mentioned. And our presenters are Wong Yi Long, uh, who is research associate at the Social Inclusion Project, uh, Kim So Yang, who is a PhD candidate at RSIS NTU, and Monish Kedia, who is a PhD candidate with our school, the Lee Kuan Yew School. Uh, so over to you, Yilong. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Koho. So now, uh, So Yang, Monish, and myself representing the Social Inclusion Project, we present on different topics with our own observations based on the track. To begin with, uh, I will first uh, introduce the basic functions of our tracker. So this tracker is available on our school website as mentioned by Dr. Koho. Uh, the tracker is made up of three panels. The chart showing on screen now is the uh, main chart showing COVID case count over time. The four country or region chart uh, shows the timing of policy response. And the last panel shows the descriptions of policy response in table form. The information displayed in these panels can be customized using the filter on the top of the tracker. Since my presentation later is about school closure policies in Hong Kong and Singapore, so I will now select these two cases uh, using the country or region filter, Hong Kong and Singapore. We can also control the timeline uh, in the horizontal uh, in the horizontal axis using the period filter. For example, we might want to look back at the period where the two cases had similar amount of cases. Yeah, and to look at daily case index uh, instead, for example, I can customize using the measure filter to view either daily or cumulative case or death. So as we can see here, 
The second panel here enables users to compare the timing and frequency of policy response between places and across uh, policy domains relative to the severity of COVID situation. Hovering uh, your mouse pointer uh, in the line will show the uh, name of the country or region, date, and the count of that date. It, each dot here represents the introduction of policy in response to COVID. We can also click on a dot here so that the table below can be refreshed uh, to show the policy details. As you may notice, the development of the tracker required the construction of a large database of policy information. It entry here indeed uh, reflect two policy uh, texts. So one is the policy date, and another, another one is policy domain and type. So what are the policy domains and types? We can look up definition of the each policy type here by clicking the info button. Uh, as Koho briefly mentioned, our team uh, defined the policy response into eight uh, domains, health, travel, closure, businesses, individual, education, social service, and others. Uh, the definition of the policy types can also be found in our user guide here. Since uh, later I will be looking at school closure policy in particular, so I will now select closure using the policy domain filter. Maybe I, we can also look at like, the very beginning of the outbreak. And here we go. As we can see here, the very first policy in Singapore uh, uh, related to culture is actually school culture policy. It was the 4th of February, which is actually 12th day after uh, Singapore reported the first case. Likewise, in Hong Kong, the first closure policy is also related to school closures, but it was just two days after the first case was reported in Hong Kong. So from this interesting uh, phenomenon that I observed from this tracker, I then zoom out a bit and look at all the information about school closures in Hong Kong and Singapore of uh, flow 2020. And this will be my focus of today. Uh, this is the timeline showing daily COVID cases and school closures in Hong Kong. The blue area represents face-to-face -face learning. The red areas represent home-based learning. The light orange area represents blended learning. And lastly, the gray areas refer to school holiday. Since the first wave of outbreak in January, Hong Kong has adapted a very strict regime of uh, precautionary measures, which was to immediately close schools when local cases began to increase. Students were unable to return to school after the Lunar New Year holiday, and school remained closed throughout a second wave in March, in which overseas students and residents started returning. School only reopened in May when the situation was fully under control. Uh, but right before the summer holidays, which usually start in mid-July, the third wave of infection uh, hit Hong Kong. Uh, school were encouraged to, forward, to bring forward the summer break, and all summer activities at school were not allowed. A new academic year in Hong Kong started in uh, September. At that time, Hong Kong was just recovering from uh, the third wave so students can only start their new academic year with school-based learning and return to school on a half-day basis when the case number was stabilized. Then the fourth wave hit and school closed again in November. So adding all this up, in 2020, primary and secondary students in Hong Kong on average only spend around 80 to 19 days at school compared to a normal school year of 119 days of teaching. Uh, Singaporean students also had an unusual academic year in 2020. A month after the first semester began, uh, so safe distancing measures were introduced at school. 
or inter-school and external activities, which used to be exciting events for students were all suspended. And as community case remained uh, increasing after the March school holiday, school instructed to progressively transit to blended learning, uh, started with one day of home-based learning per week. But this arrangement did not last long. As a part of the circuit breaker measures, all schools were later required to shift to full home-based learning. With the June school holidays being brought forward to May 5th, students had a much longer semester break than usual before they returned to school in the second semester. Students were in a weekly rotation schedule since school reopened in June and were finally able to return to school daily a month later uh, since Hong, uh, Singapore's a transit into phase two of pro circuit breaker. So in 2020, Singaporean students were still able to spend approximately 150 days at school. Comparing Hong Kong and Singapore, it's interesting to see how the two places both use school holidays as sort of a buffer to allow for flexibility in terms of school cultures. Both pace were also aware of the possible disruption caused by school coaches, and therefore they reopened and closed schools in a state manner. But students in Singapore managed to spend uh, almost a double of numbers of days in school as compared to students in Hong Kong. While we understand now that school closure policies in both cases were actually very sensitive to case number, which is an indication of their commitment to make uh, decisive actions to protect students and teachers, to prolong school closures instead have harmful physical and social outcomes on students. For some, home may not be the ideal learning environment. A large scale study in Hong Kong identifies that some uh, vulnerable groups who are experiencing disproportionate disadvantage during school closures they include families with children with special educational needs, parents with mental illness, single parent family, and low income families. An international study also reveals higher level of vulnerability among children with overcrowding home environment and or unemployed parents. And all this uh, severity of this uh, secondary adverse effect are actually in influenced by a number of factors as policy, school, and individual levels. This presentation only discusses one of these, which is the duration of school closures. In Hong Kong and Singapore, the decisions to close schools were made uh, based on public health considerations, such as uh, virus transmissibility and attack rates in children and also educational considerations, such as students' and teachers' adaptability and learning needs of students. A very solid uh, evidence of such an uh, argument is that all school culture alignments were made by uh, the Ministry of Education in the case of Singapore and uh, Education Bureau in the case of Hong Kong in consultation with public health experts. And as we can see uh, from the two cases, when the transmission rate is low, school can actually reopen consciously and in a state manner with strict uh, physical distancing within the campus. Uh, to conclude, by visualizing the two timelines of school coaches, we can uh, see the level of educational disruption in Hong Kong and Singapore. There is a combination of public health and education policies in both Hong Kong and Singapore to keep students and teachers safe and learning undisrupted. But the potential benefit of school coaches have to be balanced against the secondary efforts effect, which has the dis disproportionate disadvantage experienced by vulnerable groups during school coaches. Uh, this all for my part, I will pass my time to uh, So Yang to talk about mass policy. Thanks, Elok. Um, so I'm going to talk about, I'm going to compare the mass policies of our four regions, um, which has uh, a lot of different commonalities, being a developmental state among them. Um, the developmental state was a concept uh, first developed by Chalmers Johnson in the 80s, characterized by strong government intervention, 
uh, and regulation of economic policy for the purpose of mitigating coordination problems and connecting financial institutions to uh, industries for a specific uh, government set agenda. Uh, so what does this having been a developmental state have to do with uh, current mass policy? Um, so I find that these four regions generally have efficient government organization and state capacity. And the, the industry, the mask industry on, uh, on their part responds to these, uh, the government's incentives and cooperates with the government for a very close public private partnership. Uh, so now we're going to look at how our tracker can help understand the mask policies. So a very neat function that we have um, is if you scroll down to the bottom, as Elok has uh, briefly mentioned, you can actually search for a keyword. So if you want to search for mask policy, for example, then you can search masks and it'll re return to you all the policy descriptions containing the word mask. And you can also order it by uh, chronology. Uh, if you click on the date. So you can see how uh, chronologically the mask policies develop from just advisories of when to wear or not to wear masks uh, into um, policies about supply, um, diplomacy, and whatnot. Another neat feature of the tracker is the graphs. So we have um, great visualization. Uh, and, and it can tell us uh, the timing of the mask mandate. So by mask mandate, I mean when it was made uh, mandatory to wear masks um, in public or in public places or uh, on the public transport. Uh, but two things that I want to point out here is that uh, just because it's a mandate doesn't mean that people were not wearing masks before this. So in Taiwan, Hong Kong and South Korea, people were already widely wearing masks. Uh, secondly, uh, especially in the case of South Korea, uh, there were soft mandates before this official mandate. So people were already mandated to wear masks in high risk places, but it's just that it wasn't punishable by law. Um, it wasn't compulsory by law. Um, so you can uh, compare uh, with our tracker, uh, the daily cases and um, the policy timings. Uh, next please. So now we have a table of uh, comparing all the four regions and I've ordered it from left to right, uh, depending on how I, subjectively thought um, the, the heaviness of the, the government intervention was. So for Taiwan and Hong Kong, they directly subsidized the setting up of production lines. And as you may already know from the news, Taiwan was hugely, um, hugely successful in increasing its mask supply. Uh, it, it transformed itself from a net importer of masks to a net exporter. It was able to set up 92 production lines in just two months. And Hong Kong also set up uh, about 20 production lines. On the other hand, South Korea was already a big producer of masks from the beginning. So it chose to increase government requisition. It, it started off with 50% uh, and then increased it to 80% of all the masks uh, uh, produced. Uh, but Singapore, on the other hand, uh, relatively lacks manufacture, manufacturing capacity. So it, private and public corporations did restart uh, domestic production, but not to the level of um, not to the level of South, um, the other regions. Uh, looking at distribution, um, Taiwan and South Korea chose to ration masks, meaning that the, the residents were allowed to buy a certain number of masks on certain designated days, while Hong Kong and Singapore chose to distribute the masks for free. Um, a couple of interesting observations that I made was for Taiwan, because it was so successful in producing masks, it created its own brand image of mask diplomacy uh, under the slogan, Taiwan can help. Um, it donated millions of masks abroad, and it also allowed citizens to donate unclaimed masks, masks to um, states and regions abroad. For South Korea, uh, it also had mass diplomacy, but, uh, but what I find more interesting is how widely it cast the net for what it means to be Korean and to what extent the government is willing to care for uh, stakeholders. 
So overseas stakeholders here means uh, Korean adoptees, meaning Koreans uh, who are Korean by heritage, but were, were adopted into homes abroad. It also includes descendants of independence fighters and uh, foreign veterans of the Korean War. So some modest uh, conclusions that I've made from these observations is that generally the four regions that we've chosen have uh, heavily intervened in the, in, uh, in the mask industry to ensure a stable supply of masks and to evenly and justly uh, distribute it amongst the population. Uh, but despite the fact that all, all of these uh, regions share the commonality of being developmental states, there are still policy variation depending on the local uh, social political context. Okay, uh, thank you, Sophie. Um, my, my presentation will uh, now look at uh, the lockdown policies in these four regions in 2020. Uh, I have two observations to make and let me uh, uh, jump straight into them. The first one uh, concerns the pattern of lockdown policies uh, in these four regions. So from the data that we have collected, uh, we could categorize the four regions into three groups. Uh, the first one is uh, high coverage and low frequency in which we place Singapore. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, so high coverage means uh, the, the lockdown policy would cover many sectors of the economy at a time. Uh, the stringency of such me uh, measures would be high and, and usually the lockdown would last for a long, longer time period. However, uh, it, is, uh, it is in the low frequency category, which means that the uh, frequency of such announcements were, uh, were quite low in Singapore. The second category is high frequency and high coverage. Uh, so in which we place Hong Kong and South Korea. Now, uh, these two uh, regions would close a particular sector for say two weeks. Uh, but they would do it so often that in the end, a large part of the economy was uh, affected for a prolonged period of time. And then finally, we have the third category of uh, low frequency and low coverage, uh, which is in which we have Taiwan, which is, a, which is in a sweet spot. Uh, again, this is only based on uh, data from 2020. And an easy way of uh, remembering all of this uh, is to think about lockdowns as pizzas. So uh, you can think that Singapore ordered a big pizza in one go. Uh, Hong Kong and uh, South Korea were ordering slices of pizza, but since they ordered so many of them and so often, they ended up having a big pizza like Singapore. And then uh, Taiwan uh, only ordered one or two slices, not much. Uh, now we can also look at how uh, we can uh, glean some of this information from the tracker. So uh, in the policy domain, if you choose closures, and you choose the measure of uh, cumulative cases and you go down, then you can, um, you can glean some, some of the uh, observation that is made. So uh, for instance, uh, if you uh, think about frequency, you can see that Taiwan has very low frequency in terms of announcements regarding closures, uh, whereas Hong Kong and South Korea have a lot more and Singapore is somewhere in the between. Uh, that's about frequency. And if you want to go into the details of these closures, uh, you can look at the tables and the policy descriptions, which uh, talk about the uh, what kind of sector was closed and for what time period. Okay, uh, from here, let me go to the second observation. So for the second observation, uh, we need some background. So lockdowns, uh, uh, which are placed in the top right box are one of the many tools which can be used to achieve the immediate policy goal of uh, reducing the spread of virus caused by uh, intermingling between individuals. Uh, continuing on the pizza analogy, if you are uh, hungry, you could order a pizza, but at the same time, you could order a burger, a, pa a pasta or dim sums, which is to say that governments have multiple tools uh, in their toolbox to achieve the same objective. Now, these four regions have been using, have used all of these uh, uh, four, uh, four categories of tools in different combinations uh, and at some point or the other based on their long-term and overall pandemic strategy. Uh, so for instance, if you look at the framework by Baker and colleagues on the next slide, uh, it might be one way of categorizing the overall pandemic strategy of uh, nations based on the type, timing, and mix of the policy tools they use. 
Uh, however, uh, since I made the observation regarding uh, Taiwan uh, being in a sweet spot, uh, let us see why, uh, uh, why Taiwan might have ended up in that place. So if you look at the data from our tracker uh, uh, for, for, the, for these four cases, um, before the first uh, reported case of COVID-19, these four regions happened about at the same time. So it's about uh, 21st January in Taiwan and, and about uh, two, one or two days apart in uh, other, other, other three cases. However, what we see from data is that Taiwan did a lot, uh, lot more even before the first case was reported. So Taiwanese leaders were setting up coordination channels, uh, checking their infect infectious disease control capacity, uh, screening people at ports, asking residents to mask up uh, and, and see a doctor is sick. Uh, Taiwan even introduced uh, rapid testing kits as early as 11 January. Uh, so overall, uh, Taiwan's timing and mix of uh, tools served it well in uh, 2020. Um, so finally, to summarize the two observations, uh, the first observation was regarding the lockdown pattern, and we can categorize these four regions in these three categories. And the second uh, is regarding how important tool timing and mix is uh, in terms of uh, designing a response to a pandemic uh, like this. Uh, so with that, I conclude. Uh, we have some references which we have used uh, to present, uh, to design our slides and our analysis. Uh, that's all, thank you. And I'll pass the virtual mic back to Dr. Thank you very much, um, Yilong. Uh, so Yang and Monish. So those slides as well as the, the references will be made available online af after the event. Um, next up, we have our two panelists. Um, first speaker is Professor Donald Lowe. Donald is a professor of practice in public policy at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, director of the university's Institute for Emerging Market Studies, as well as director of leadership and public policy executive education. And of course, Donald is also co-author of the Immediately So Out book, uh, released recently, PAP versus PAP, uh, The Party's Struggle to Adapt to a Changing Singapore. I'll hand the time over now to Donald. Mm, thank you very much, uh, Kok Ho. I really want to congratulate you uh, and the team, and of course, the LKY School, uh, for developing this uh, tracker. Uh, just, just based on the presentations, I, I think it's really very uh you know, detail and provides a lot of granular insights, I think, potentially uh, for researchers, scholars, media, uh, students. Uh, so, you know, warm congratulations to, to you and your team and all the hard work that must have gone into this. Uh, it's also great to see so many former colleagues and uh, students, on, on if, even if it's only online. Uh, Monish, I like, I like the uh, pizza analogy. <laughs> I like that. Uh, yeah, I think in, in Hong Kong where we, you know, we claim that we say that we in Hong Kong never had to resort to lockdowns. We never really had any restrictions on dining, except for a period during the third wave where, and also the fourth wave, where restaurants were, had to close by six. Uh, but restaurants were never completely closed, and you could always uh, eat out. But I think that that metaphor makes sense. You have you you can have so many slices, so many restrictions that they add up to some, something like a lockdown, right? Something to like to the whole pizza. Uh, so, so I thought what I'll say in my comments is just to you know provide some perspective, some uh, commentary on responses to COVID nineteen uh, in Hong Kong and Singapore. Uh, the people I speak to, both in Hong Kong and Singapore, usually highlight you know they emphasize the differences between our two governments uh, and their response to COVID, uh, and they tend to have a rather simplistic narrative, right? Hong Kongers don't trust their government; they are very rebellious. Singaporeans, on the other hand, have high trust in you know, this very competent, powerful administrative state and, and but they're also, and they're very compliant, right? And, and, and they're like sheep. Uh, I think these uh, narratives kind of oversimplify uh, the situation. And in fact, I would argue today uh, that I find that there are far more similarities and I think your tracker shows that there are far more similarities in Hong Kong and Singapore's approach to COVID-19, then there are differences. And maybe it's because we are so similar, we have so much in common, that people tend to focus on the few differences that exist. So for instance, right from the start, both Hong Kong and Singapore adopted uh, a strict and, and over time an increasingly strict uh, containment approach rather than a mitigatory one. 
Now, this strict containment approach has, over time, been shown to be effective, right? Uh, quite successful in curbing the spread of the virus and in ensuring that our healthcare systems are not overwhelmed. Now that we have highly effective vaccines, both our governments have rolled out mass vaccination campaigns, uh, befitting our status as this highly competent developmental state. Singapore has the highest vaccination rate in Southeast Asia, while Hong Kong has the highest vaccination rate in Northeast Asia, in, in Northeast Asia notwithstanding the fact that there's been some uh, vaccine hes hesitancy in Hong Kong. Uh, but at the same time, you know, if you all read the Atlantic magazine, uh, the, the, the Atlantic magazine recently described places like Singapore and Hong Kong, among others, China, Vietnam, Australia, New Zealand, uh, as being in COVID purgatory, right? Uh, now, we shouldn't react too strongly to that. I think purgatory is absolutely the right metaphor because we are not yet in, we are, we are clearly not in COVID hell, right? Neither Singapore nor Hong Kong, but we are not yet in COVID heaven, right? Or post-COVID heaven. We still have restrictions. Uh, this, you know, travel is still extremely limited. The Mac, uh, Atlantic goes on to argue that to suggest that countries in this COVID purgatory are there because of a risk aversion and that this risk aversion arises from our earlier success in driving COVID infection rates to zero or close to zero. Others, uh, including James Crabtree, who used to be at the LKY Square, have argued that our early success in containment has now become a burden. Uh, they use the term a winner's curse, the winner's curse, that prevent our governments from lifting travel and other pandemic restrictions and other stringent restrictions uh, sooner, given our fear and our citizens' fear of new outbreaks. I'm not suggesting that this risk aversion is, is, is irrational or misguided. Uh, sometimes risk aversion can indeed be rational, as I'm sure uh, uh, you know, uh, students of behavioral biases would, would know, right? Uh, a bird in hand is often worth uh, more than two in the bush. But it's, I think it is quite clearly the case that our uh, risk aversion in exiting the pandemic now that vaccines are available uh, is partly at least a product of our prior success in, uh, in, in aggressive containment. I would also suggest that the similarities we see in Singapore and Hong Kong's approach to uh, COVID-19 is at least partly the result of history. Right? We both, uh, as, your, as the tracker suggests, right, that you know, we're all developmental states, we have a strong competent administrative, we all have strong competent administrative states but in the case of Hong Kong and Singapore in particular, we also inherited this Anglo-Saxon uh, tradition uh, of residual welfare. Uh, and from the 1990s onwards, we both pursued new public management or MPM reforms uh, in healthcare. And of course, we were both severely affected by the SARS uh, epidemic or the SARS pandemic back in 2003. So, 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 so first, uh, we both have these, or at least we inherited this uh, Anglo-Saxon model of residual welfare, which means that our welfare, health and welfare systems tend to be lean, very efficient, uh, rather than, you know, we emphasize efficiency rather than equity. Uh, our reforms in these systems tend to emphasize reducing wastage, containing cost pressures, weeding out, you know, welfare abusers and trying to promote individual responsibility. Uh, so as a manifestation of that, for instance, if you look at just comparing developed economies, Hong Kong and Singapore have the lowest hospital bed to population ratio and the lowest physician to population ratio. In terms of health spending, where in OECD countries, the average spending in, in healthcare is about 9% of GDP. Hong Kong's is only about 6% of GDP and Singapore's is even lower at 4% of GDP. Uh, and like other countries with that Anglo-Saxon tradition of residual welfare, Hong Kong and Singapore were very much at the forefront of NPM, right? New public, public management reforms in healthcare since the early 1990s. And what were these reforms? So privatization and corporatization. So in Singapore, for instance, all right, our public hospitals are in fact corporatized entities, uh, even though they receive government subvention. Uh, another very common NPM reform is trying to promote competition and consumer choice, use market discipline to keep costs down, create internal markets uh, in healthcare. Third, we emphasize efficiency gains and cost savings in healthcare. Uh, and fourth, we try to reduce waste. We try to reduce slack. We try to make our system run more efficiently, operate more efficiently. Now, you might ask, what has all of this got to do with our response to COVID-19? And my argument, I know this is somewhat con controversial, is that you know the fact of the matter is, or 
uh, not, not really a fact, this, this, this can be contested. Uh, uh, my argument is that our healthcare systems do not, right, Hong Kong and Singapore, do not have much slack of redundancy. Right? On any day, even before the pandemic, you walk into a public hospital in Singapore or in Hong Kong, bed occupancy is above 80%, right? Uh, there are queues in A and E. Uh, so, you know, so, you know, because they're so efficient, right, uh, our healthcare system, we don't have much slack or redundancy. And perhaps, therefore, it is not surprising that we had to pursue aggressive containment. Uh, at least at the start of the pandemic. And so mitigation was not really an option for us because, you know, given how lean our healthcare systems were, uh, you know, they, they can be very easily overwhelmed if, you know, we, we adopted the mitigation approach. Now, with COVID-19, it happens to be the case that aggressive containment, suppression, turned out to be the correct strategy, right? Uh, you know, Sweden adopted the mitigation approach initially, and by the end of 2020, it realized that, you know, it, it, even its very well-resourced healthcare system was being overwhelmed. So in, in the case of COVID-19, containment is absolutely, at least initially for the first year, for the first year and a half, is absolutely the correct strategy. But this may not be the case with future epidemics, right? Containment also may not always be possible or it may be too costly. I would even argue that with COVID-19, we are coming very close to that point in the pandemic where it may make more sense for us to mitigate, right, to, and for society to adapt to COVID-19 as endemic, rather than to still focus uh, principally on containment or suppression. So that's one, uh, I think, one basis, one reason why our responses were so similar. Our residual welfare system, uh, which spills over into health, how we organize and finance healthcare, as well as the NPM reforms that we pursued since the 1990s. The second big reason I think we were so similar, uh, we have been so similar, is of course SARS, right? Uh, SARS in Hong Kong was extremely traumatizing. Uh, it lasted just over four months, infected, you know, uh, 1,755 people and caused 300 deaths. It was the second, you know, place with the second highest of deaths after mainland China. Hong Kong had 40%, of, nearly 40% of the deaths uh, during SARS worldwide. Uh, Singapore is fourth, by the way, uh, with, I think we were, with 30 deaths. The COVID death toll in Hong Kong so far is only, well, only 2003, lower than SARS. I think Hong Kong is the only place in the world uh, that has had more deaths in SARS than, uh, than deaths due to COVID-19. Even in Singapore, the death toll uh, due to COVID-19 has now exceeded that of SARS. And... How did the Hong Kong government respond to, uh, respond to SARS? Very badly is the short answer. They completely uh, mishandled it. Uh, it was shambolic. After SARS, the uh, uh, health and welfare secretary, EKU, had to step down. The chairman of the hospital authority had to step down. So you can understand why Hong Kongers don't really trust the Hong Kong government in the public health crisis. The last time there was a major one, well, the government's response left a lot to be desired. Uh, so... You know, the, the government was blamed, heavily blamed by both the public as well as by healthcare workers. It's unthinkable for us in Singapore that healthcare workers would criticise <laughs> the, 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 the politicians or the, the ministers. But, you know, in, in Hong Kong, that's very common. Uh, they were criticised for not taking the outbreak seriously at an early stage. Uh, they were criticised for sounding the alarm too late. Uh, the Hong Kong government underestimated the crisis, tried too hard to reassure the public instead of taking uh, expeditious steps in infection control, in you know, mandating the wearing of face masks, school closures, quarantine, you know, all the measures that have now become very uh, normalized huh, uh, in COVID-19. And this is SARS, which is, of course, far more deadly. Right? Uh, Post-SARS, the Hong Kong government revamped Hong Kong's anti-epidemic SOPs, strengthened precautionary mechanisms, and drop, you know, very robust uh, contingency plans. An overall contingency system was established to set up a clear command structure. Because during SARS, the health minister was fighting with the uh, with the chairman of the hospital authority. It wasn't a single chain of command. Uh, um, so, and central to this, uh, you know, contingency management system was a three-level response system, very similar to our DOSCON system in Singapore. And this system was meant to ensure expeditious uh, interventions underpinned by detailed contingency plans. 
And a new center for health protection was set up within the Department of Health to take the lead in such you know, uh, crisis response measures. And of course, people in Hong Kong now all know about uh, the Center for Health Protection Act. Almost on a daily basis, briefings on uh, COVID-19 will be given by, uh, the, by the CHP and the person who runs CDC, the Center for Communicable Disease, uh, Communicable Disease Center, which is part of the CHP, Dr. Chuang. So, so this says something about Hong Kongers, right? Because the, they don't trust politici their politicians. Uh, you know, the politicians have had to let the experts, like the technocrats, take the lead in these crisis communication efforts. And that, to a large extent, has helped Hong Kong uh, ensure high levels of compliance with uh, those uh, control measures, with those uh, pandemic measures. In Singapore, uh, as many in the audience would know, okay, actually many in the audience would not know because you're too young. <laughs> I, I lived through uh, SARS. I was in the government during SARS. Uh, it was much less traumatizing, but still, I think, you know, there was a great deal of fear and anxiety uh, in, in society. And one of the outcomes of the SARS crisis was the recognition in government that operational preparedness had to be strengthened across the healthcare system. This meant developing contingency plans at all our healthcare institutions, regular exercises that you know, had epidemic scenarios, the building up of a stockpile of critical medical supplies such as PPE, and establishing more isolation facilities in all hospitals. And then a new 330-bed NCID, National Center for Infectious Disease, was commissioned and completed in 2019, right? Talk about good timing, just a year before uh, the COVID, uh, COVID broke out. And of course, all other hospitals also had to step up, ramp up their isolation facilities. So that's the second reason uh, for broadly similar response. And then the third, I think, you know, you look at, you know, uh, what's happening now. I think in most developed economies, uh, the direction of travel is very much clearly towards, you know, lifting these, uh, allowing for free movement and travel, uh, you know, once you reach a certain vaccination rate. So, you know, the clear direction of travel is we are now exiting the pandemic. But if you look at Hong Kong and Singapore, you know, that's, you know, we're still trapped in, okay, not trapped, but we're still, we seem to be stuck in purgatory. Uh, so I said earlier that Hong Kong and Singapore are coming close to the point where we think we should we should probably start moving, even if it's gingerly, uh, from containment to mitigation, right? Uh, so, so in the Atlantic magazine's metaphor, we should go from purgatory to heaven, right? <laughs> At least start moving in that direction. Uh, in this regard, I think Singapore has done a much better job than Hong Kong. It's probably ahead of Hong Kong, not just in terms of vaccination, right? Uh, I mean, Singapore has vaccinated about twice as many of its citizens uh, compared to Hong Kong, 40% of Singaporeans or people in Singapore are vaccinated compared to just about 20% in Hong Kong, fully vaccinated. Uh, more importantly, Singapore's ministers have talked about COVID-19 becoming endemic. They've articulated kind of a roadmap uh, of what the new uh, and a vision of what the new normal might look like. More pe most people would be vaccinated. There'll be regular testing to identify and you know, uh, uh, contain uh, outbreaks early. Uh, rapid technologically enabled tracing, right? Thanks to our uh, uh, Trace Together app. Uh, Hong Kong is behind in almost all of this, except maybe in testing. Uh, but its leaders have not articulated a roadmap for getting to this new normal. In fact, they don't even talk about uh, COVID being endemic. And also because of governmental inertia, you know, uh, and and, bureau and and pressure, of course, from Beijing. Hong Kong is still wedded to this zero COVID uh, strategy, which of course hurts subsequent efforts to you know, resume normality, to accept that COVID will, you know, will be with us for the foreseeable future. future. So all this suggests that Hong Kong is likely to be in, in purgatory uh, for much longer in Singapore. So I know people in Singapore, you, you, know, you, you may chafe under the current restrictions, but you can take comfort that you know, this, is, this punishment is temporary and it's not going to last very much longer. And you can look forward to you know, decisive steps towards opening, uh, say, after National Day. So with that, uh, I look forward to the discussion. And thank you very much, Kokho, for, and, and to the team uh, uh, for inviting me. Thank you very much, Donald. Um, lots there to 
to pick up on later. I uh, just want to encourage the audience, if you already have questions and thoughts in response to what Donald has said, uh, please do post this on the Q&A if you are watching us on Zoom or just leave it in the comments column on Facebook Live. Right. Um, our next panelist is Professor Alfred Wu. Uh, Alfred is Assistant Dean of Research and Associate Professor uh, in the Lee Kuan Yew School. His research interests uh, include public sector reform, central local fiscal relations, corruption and governance, and social protection in Greater China. And Alfred is also one of the colleagues in the school who is doing active research on COVID-19 responses in the region. Uh, over to you, Alfred. Uh, thanks. Um... Thanks to co-host uh, teams on this effort. I mean, uh, it's very, very useful. I also um, shared a, a database with some of researchers uh, in different regions, they, and they like it very much. Um, I would argue that uh, uh, in terms of these four uh, regions, um, past dependency still, is, um, um, still matter a lot because of uh, like Hong Kong and Singapore, I would think uh, they have very good conditions. So they have different policy tools to handle for COVID-19. For example, I recently I looked into HDI, um, HDI, Human Development Index. I find that the, the major quality of life, education, and also health dimension, those are, of, are dimension are very, very important to uh, effective needs of uh, COVID, uh, COVID measure. You can see, like Singapore rank very, very high, rank 11 in the world, according to 2019 data. Uh, Hong Kong rank even higher, Hong Kong rank uh, number four in the world in 2019. Uh, Taiwan and South Korea, they rank uh, 23rd uh, in the world. Uh, in, so in generally, I would say that uh, they, are, they are pretty much um, on very good page uh, to handle COVID-19. Uh, the issue is, uh, Different countries may have uh, different strategy uh, at different point. For example, like uh, Donald mentioned about uh, zero COVID strategy. I also am very puzzled by uh, why Hong Kong government actually still use very much like um, whole government approach and also very much uh, care about whether they have how many uh, cases every day. Um, then a lot of debate are still very much associated with China uh, in terms of uh, COVID measure. So my second point will be talking about the relationship with uh, made in China. I think uh, co host team uh, did not uh, mention about this point. At the very beginning, uh, a lot of country and also regions look into um, China's experience for containing uh, COVID spread. I think it, it's a very good uh, at the very beginning, you can, you can actually learn from a country who actually has the experience to manage COVID-19. But now the problem is uh, if you look into like uh, lockdowns, lockdown in Singapore is totally different from lockdown in China. A uh, lockdown in Singapore is also totally different from lockdown in Hong Kong. For example, uh, in Hong Kong, you will lock down the whole block. But in Singapore, you just lock down some HDB, then ask HDB people to go through the test. But it does not mean that very much strict uh, so-called lockdown, but uh, Hong Kong still adopted a similar strategy from beginning until now. So my sense is uh, sometimes uh, in terms of uh, effectiveness of uh, COVID control, the relationship with China and also how to learn from China will become a very tricky issue at this moment. Thank you. Thanks, Alfred. Uh, right. Now, so uh, do keep those questions coming in uh, as, as we chat uh, with the panel as a whole. Right. So Donald, Alfred, certainly. And also, uh, if people have questions pertaining to the earlier presentations on masks, lockdowns and education, school closures, uh, do send those in as well. Um, my first question has to do with um, something that Donald alluded to, uh, which is um, Right now, it seems very far away, at least I think to us, to Singaporeans, right? The, the protests in Hong Kong that happened shortly before the COVID-19 outbreak and kind of the how, how the protests blended into COVID-19 is so powerfully captured in the icon of the masks, right? At one point, the masks stood for something else completely different, but now I, I don't know if 
we remember that those were things that people were allowed or not allowed to wear for as part of protests and so on. So it seemed to a Singaporean audience that the politics in Hong Kong seems to have disappeared during COVID-19. Um, likewise in Singapore, I mean, I mean, I know we've all lost sense of the kind of the passage of time, but there was also a fairly interesting general election that happened right smack during the height of COVID, right? Um, so, but how, how do we make sense of this? Where is the politics in terms of the government's responses to COVID-19, uh, the difficulties of, of getting what they want done, uh, how the public support or do not support the, the the government's decisions, where do we find the politics in, in all of this? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Koho. That's a question I'm often asked. Uh, and of course, people say the trust, low trust in the Hong Kong government uh, can be attributed to the protests. Uh, I think it's more nuanced than that. And generally, Hong Kongers are just more skeptical, right? partly because of the way the Hong Kong government bungled its response to SARS. So there's a longer history than the protests. Uh, around, you know, that explained Hong Kong's low trust uh, in government. Of course, the protests didn't help, right? And because of the protests, those trust levels went to, you know, levels that were so low that were never experienced before, unprecedentedly low levels. But what is surprising, uh, and it goes back to, you know, what Alfred says about path dependence and enduring strength, is that the Hong Kong politicians may not be trusted, but the Hong Kong civil service, technocratic health, public health professionals are hugely trusted. Right? So trust might be very context dependent and sector specific. I mentioned to you doc, Dr. Chuang at the CHP. You know, <laughs> her approval ratings are off the charts. Uh, I suspect maybe even higher than our ministers in Singapore. Uh, I'm, I'm just speculating. Uh, so, so, yeah. So, so, but yeah, I think you're right. Uh, Politics has clearly taken a backseat. Uh, and also in, in the initial stages, in the first month of the pandemic, uh, Hong Kong people actually felt the Hong Kong government wasn't doing enough. Uh, measures weren't stringent enough, right? Uh, for instance, why didn't you close all the borders, with, all the land borders with mainland China? Uh, whether that re request was reasonable or realistic or not, that's, that's not the point. But you know, even nurses at an early stage uh, threatened to go on strike. Uh, because that that land, not all the land borders were closed. Uh, so, so you know, the Hong Kong government was criticized for not being taking this uh, COVID nineteen seriously enough. Uh, and and so a lot of the, as I think Yilok mentioned, a lot of the initial measures that were taken were mask wearing, especially social distancing, were self imposed by Hong Kong people themselves. Right, they applied pressure on each other to. Whereas in Singapore, we tended to say, well, what does government say? Uh, then on, what else? What else can I say? Um, yeah, I think yeah, yeah. So, and of, of course, in politics, the other thing that seems that has driven out the politics has been in Hong Kong uh, has been the national security law uh, that was introduced in June uh, or July, so about a year now uh, in Hong Kong, and that has made it very you know very punitive for people to engage in anything, not just protests, like you know, uh, you know. People were arrested. Uh, uh, people who were involved in the protests were arrested. Yesterday, Apple Daily closed. Uh, so you know, so I think that has really. We talk about you know uh, how political discourse in Singapore might have been chilled or dampened sometimes, but in Hong Kong, that the NSL has really uh, driven. Or oh, Lechko now doesn't have any opposition or you know pan democratic representation. So that has really driven out the politics in, in, in Hong Kong. But at the same time, Hong Kongers. You know, kind of accept these uh, uh, measures, whether they come from the government or not, uh, because you know they 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 have a very bad memory uh, of how these things can be badly mishandled, and and the fear, the distrust from SARS still uh, that you know there's still mem uh, memories, remnants of that. <clears throat> Thanks, Donald. Uh, anything to add, Alfred? Uh, in terms of. The, the politics of governing COVID-19 in, in any of these four places? Uh, I, I, I would think um, um, Hong Kong people are doing really good. Um, when I was uh, living in Hong Kong, uh, pe when people had the flu, they were, uh, they were wearing masks. So uh, basically, it's a kind of a very much grassroots level um, 
everybody will do the same thing. So it's no matter the government say something. So, so basically it's a kind of a very much bottom up approach. This is something very, very useful in fighting COVID-19. Mm. Okay. Um, thanks, Alfred. Um, uh, a second question um, has to do with uh, what the panel has really brought up in terms of the transition. And I look at the questions in the, in the Q&A and in the comments column. That's what most people are thinking. In fact, people have very specific requests. When can we travel again? Can you tell us? When do we not have to do a quarantine? So I'm not sure if it's fair to ask the panel this, when you can have your next holiday without having to worry again. But in terms of this transition, right, this exit from purgatory, as Dono describes it, um, what are some of the, this is one of the questions in the, in the Q&A, um, what are some of the preconditions? When do we know whether a place is ready to, to exit to a softer strategy? It's probably not a one time, right? Where people will move in stages and small increments. But what are some of the preconditions that tell us that this place is now ready, you need to work your way out of purgatory? Yeah, I think the most obvious is uh, uh, pen, uh, vaccination levels, right? Uh, I think if any, above 50%, you should be, can be quite confident in heading in the direction. And Singapore is coming very close to that. So I think by end of July, we, we, Singapore will probably be about 50%. Hong Kong is much slower. Second, and I, and I think this point is not emphasized enough, is you have to prepare your population, particularly in places like Hong Kong where people are already so risk averse. You know, they cannot accept. People already have this zero risk bias, right? Uh, so you know, if you suddenly spring it on people and say that, oh, we just have to live with this, uh, this is too costly, people will think you are callous, right? Uh, that you prioritize money over lives. So I think you have to prepare people for it. So in that regard, in this having this crisis narrative, right? This, you know, this give, preparing people and telling people that this is our general direction of travel, right? And yes, in the short term, we may have to pause. Sometimes we may even have to take a, a, a small detour as Singapore is doing now with uh, this uh, heightened alert. Uh, but you still have to give people the light at the end of the tunnel. It's like you, you are on a journey with your kids and the kids keep asking, right? Uh, how, how long more, right? Uh, and you have to say, well, you know, you give them a sense that we are getting there, you know, 30 minutes more, whatever. Uh, in Hong Kong, there has been no such effort at preparing the population and even suggesting that this is something which will become endemic, that we have to learn to live with this, that with vaccination, you know, this with vaccination, if the population is mostly vaccinated, this becomes very much like the flu. Because even if you catch it, right, the, you will not require hospitalization, uh, only, right, and, and most people will just have very mild symptoms. So I think that that, that crisis narrative, that crisis communications is key and giving people this sense that, you know, we are headed in the right direction. And the main metric, I think, as I would say, is that uh, the other metric to look at would be hospitalization, because with vaccination, uh, as we have seen in many of these uh, European countries, vaccinations have severed the link between cases and hospitalization cases. So looking at cases now might be very misleading, right? Uh, so you should really say, well, what's the impact on the healthcare system? As long as, as the healthcare system is not burden and can cope with the numbers, easily cope with the numbers, then COVID-19 being endemic is really not the problem. <clears throat> any, any thoughts from the rest of the panel? Just on the, uh, br briefly on the point of Professor uh, Donald on uh, preparing the population regarding the, you know, moving to something which is less restrictive. I, I want to ask because Professor Donald mentioned about Professor James Crabtree's remark that, you know, early success in handling might have become, you know, a burden in terms of uh, risk aversion. But, but to me, I, uh, on the flip side, it seems like because of uh, some heavy restrictions in the beginning, a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, a little bit of uh, removal of restrictions, for instance, in Singapore, uh, now in this year, in 2021, we are doing we are not going for for whole uh, lockdown kind of uh, approach, but we are trying to like close down uh, smaller places for shorter period of time. 
So maybe uh, the earlier uh, success might help in kind of transitioning because people feel that, okay, at least it's not as heavy as 2020, now in 2021, kind of like, so what of Don thinks of Yeah, of course, uh, if you've managed to suppress uh, and curb the numbers, and if you were, have developed other capabilities besides vaccination, like rapid, like widespread testing, early testing, better contact tracing capabilities, you know, you, you can, you can loosen up on lockdown because the lockdown is really a very draconian measure that suggests that uh, other efforts in right in trying to uh, prevent an outbreak or to limit the spread of the virus have failed, which is why you re- need to resort to something so drastic. Uh, so yeah, you're absolutely right. As we get better with these, you know, rapid testing, you know, uh, targeted containment of uh, specific clusters, uh, if you're very good at doing that, then obviously you don't need to resort to those. Uh, harsh measures. But vaccination is the ultimate pro- protection, right? I mean, uh, because with it, even if people catch it, uh, even if people are infected, uh, the, the symptoms will be mild, for, at least for most people, for 90% of, of, of people who are vaccinated and are infected, you know, they wouldn't require hospital treatment, you know, they do not, uh, they, 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 they will not use up, right, uh, scarce uh, medical resources. Um, switching to a slightly different topic, this has come up uh, now in a couple of the questions in the Q&A. Uh, so we've been talking about the populations as uh, singular entities. Uh, so these questions are pointing out that, in, in fact, um, well, as we know, uh, Hong Kong and Singapore are both uh, fairly unequal societies uh, according to most of the common metrics and so on. Uh, and there have been commentaries pointing out how these have become more obvious or have flared up during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, how, how would you say, how successful has uh, this government been uh, at protecting their populations so that these inequalities do not uh, severely infect people's well-being? How have they managed their pre-existing inequalities during a, a pandemic that, that affects different people differently? Maybe I'll respond. Um, thanks to Coho's team's uh, help, uh, basically I'm reviewing uh, the, the budget in Hong Kong and Singapore. So uh, mostly we could see that the, uh, these two places are spending money on particularly so-called poor people or like uh, marginalized people. Um, if you can see that uh, a lot of budget um, responses at the very beginning, like uh, New Zealand, they, they, they came up with a budget called well-being budget. Well-being budget means that they are no longer very much uh, focused on infrastructure. They are much more focused on how to help people uh, manage their like, uh, mental health. Uh, because of like in Singapore context, we also could see that domestic violence increased a lot over the past year, particularly, particularly under uh, COVID-19 then government need to do something to help uh, particularly these marginal people to survive under, co- under COVID-19. But unfortunately, I could see um, many very much authoritarian countries, they are not doing enough to help the poor people. But fortunately, these so-called four little tigers are really spending money on helping them. Yeah, I'll just add to say that, you know, here again, Hong Kong and Singapore have a great deal of similarities. Uh, You know, I refer to this Anglo-Saxon tradition model of residual welfare. So in such models, we tend to tolerate much higher levels of inequality, right, compared to uh, the Nordic system or compared to, you know, the continental social insurance systems. Which incidentally, the other two tigers, uh, the dragons, uh, South Korea and Taiwan have, right? They have much more comprehensive insurance uh, systems. Uh, Hong Kong and Singapore following the Anglo-Saxon uh, tradition. And our welfare systems tend to be a lot more targeted. We don't have, you know, we don't have any automatic, you know, we emphasize means testing. Uh, welfare system is much narrower. Uh, and we don't have any, very few automatic, uh, you know, for instance, we don't have unemployment insurance. Uh, so 
what it means doesn't mean it's a bad system. What it simply means is that when you get a crisis like that, you must respond very quickly with discretionary fiscal measures. And in that respect, again, Singapore has done better. Right? All these supplementary budgets, uh, I think four at, or three or four, I kind of lost count. Right? Uh, and they have been very generous also to some extent. Uh, and it reflects both Singapore's, not just high level of fiscal reserves, because Hong Kong also has that, but also high levels of implementation capacity, right? getting the money out quickly, not just to businesses, but more importantly to households. So Singapore has done better on that. In Hong Kong, yeah, there was some of these uh, uh, you know, cash support measures, but it took much longer to get to people. Uh, so again, reflecting that you know, even though it has all these fiscal reserves, uh, implementation capacity is probably weaker in Hong Kong. Mm. But you're right, I think I'm, I'm, the, the structural issue is is, is, uh, is that, you know, we are societies that tolerate, accept higher levels of inequality. Right? We are far more agnostic about, ambivalent about inequality compared to uh, social democracies, compared to... So we are, in that sense, again, right? we, are, we are much more like the US or Britain than we are Germany or, 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 or Sweden. Mm. Um, the the to to switch the discussion you now the slight something slightly different, um, which is how these economies are are faring. Right? Um, it seems sometimes that one of the difficulties is that there is so much flux now between kind of short term volatility and longer term trends. I mean, to to I think most uh, average citizens looking at the. I mean, to someone, let's say, who has just lost uh, his livelihood and is trying to decide on, we, we talk about training a lot, right? But what training cost to attend? Where, which is the next basket in which to put my eggs? Um, where I should develop my skills in and so on. Um, how, how does one begin to read these trends when there is so much flux? Um, it occurred to me, even small decisions like a short period of the heightened alert in Singapore, work from home, can affect two parts of uh, the same, what we like to think of as the same industry, right? Platform works so differently. We can say work from home, suddenly the private hire car drivers have no work and suddenly the riders have a lot of business. So there is this sort of, but on the, in, the, in the long term, do we expect platform work to pick up? Is that a good industry in which to hedge one's bets? So in the midst of all this flux, this trying to decipher what is short term, what is long term, how, how, how can policymakers best go about making plans? Oh, that, that's, oh, this, this, this deserves another uh, a seminar or whatever. Uh, I, think, I think the pandemic is as good a catalyst as any uh, for rethinking our welfare states, right? Uh, in the midst of technology, technological change, the rise of the gig economy, the... Uh, the, you know how middle class jobs have also become very precarious. Uh, there's some talk, mostly in Europe, about how the pandemic would and should uh, lead to a major rethink of our welfare state. The last time there was a major rethink of our welfare state, well, the welfare state was created after the Second World War, right? Cradle to grave protection and all that. And then it was severely eroded. It didn't disappear but it was eroded, it was not dismantled completely, but it became a lot less generous, became a lot more austere, thanks to the new public management reforms of the you know, uh, 80s and 90s. Uh, I think the pandemic might, I, I'm, I'm not sure it would, but it might herald an, a third uh, um, configuration, right? a, 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 a welfare state 3.0. And in this respect, I think places like Hong Kong, Singapore in particular can can play a leading role, right? Because if you want to embrace all these technological advances, if you want to be as open as before to free trade, then you have to think of more active ways of compensating, right? Uh, citizens who are who face disruptions, who face greater risks. Uh, in that welfare state 2.0, part of that, you know, new public management reforms, we many risks were shifted to individuals, right? As we, you know, as government became more market oriented. Uh, so I think the pandemic should really force policymakers, as you suggest, uh, to think, how should we rethink this balance of risk between state and citizens, society and individuals? Um, no easy answers because, uh, because you know, the crisis may not be the best uh, 
in during a crisis, it may not be the best time to come up with these long-term structural reforms. But certainly, you know, as we exit the pandemic, these are hard questions that we have to grapple with. So, so in that sense, I'm a little disappointed, right? That in 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 these East Asian tiger economies, these developmental states, we have not really used the pandemic as an opportunity to say, well, what's the post-pandemic social compact that we want to craft? I don't know. You, you've done a lot of work on this. What, what's your sense of uh, whether this pandemic will indeed catalyze that sort of rethinking and reformulation of our social contract? Mm, yeah, I, I worry that, I mean, in, in public policy, we teach students that crisis is one of the few opportunities for structural change, right? reconfiguration, rethinking, and so on. <laughs> and I imagine a pandemic on this scale is as big a crisis as you can imagine. And yet, <laughs> there are so many parts of kind of uh, decision making um, that sound very much like business as usual, right? If one only looked at the language used, for example, in the recommendations of the Emerging Stronger Task Force in Singapore, um, if I took out 2021 and took out the word COVID, you wouldn't know that it was from this year, right? Sometimes you get a feeling, right? So I suppose the next time I have to talk to students about structural change, I have to, I, I don't know if I'll feel embarrassed to say that crisis can trigger change because apparently this crisis is not big enough to do that. And, and why do you think that is? Uh, I mean, may, maybe it's because we've been so successful, right? In, yeah. You know, uh, that it has not created a, a big enough shock uh, yeah. to decision makers and to, and, and, and to societies, right? Because if societies don't demand these things, yeah. if societal demand for welfare reform is weak, why should policy policymakers respond? Yeah, it's true. I think it's a reminder of the, the durability and resilience of institutions. Huh? So if the, the way decisions are made does not change, then you should not expect decisions themselves to change, right? And those things are, I think, very much still intact, right? Uh, notwithstanding a, a global pandemic, the way decisions. So here we maybe have to turn, turn to, to, to politics uh, for, for answers. Maybe and then I, I can ask the, the panel also, as well as the you know the wonderful folks on the on the project. What about besides you know social inclusion and inequality reduction? What about sustainability? Because the other thing that this pandemic has made quite apparent is that we need more sustainable economies, we need more sustainable practices, and if any uh, with climate change, this is as this is a very powerful wake up call us to you know really move on that front right the environmental sustainability agenda do you see any change in east asia in, in, in on, on the sustainability agenda i, I can i can uh, jump on this very briefly so i think uh, there are in terms of sustainability it really depends on sustainability of what but then uh, i think it dip, like there are levels of it so if we think about say just travel for instance then singapore is already uh, installing systems uh, in changi airport where you know you can um, digitally verify vaccine reports and uh, covid tests uh, so that travel becomes easy so i think that is something looking at a more, more long term you know that covid is here to stay uh, we'll need these systems uh, in order to uh, do that uh, but if we go like higher up, uh, maybe in terms of say, the economy, uh, then what we see from at least, uh, you know, prim uh, primarily from the data is that, uh, again, there is a, a very strong focus on uh, skilling. So a lot of money being spent on skilling and moving the, uh, the, the citizens towards, you know, developing those kind of digital skills. Uh, which can help, uh, you know, working from home and these kind of stuff. So, so I think, uh, yeah, those are minor points that we can see at least uh, from the data. Yeah, my response would be that I, um, at the beginning of the outbreak, like both Hong Kong and Singapore, as well as other places, uh, experienced panic buying by citizens uh, because of the disruption to global supply chain, whereas we cannot get what we need for daily life from our uh, labors. So from that point of view, actually, there was debate like, in certain places or, or whether we can self-sustain like ourselves. Uh, this also leads to another question, like 
uh, sustainability uh, in what intention, in the intention of like uh, providing enough for ourselves or uh, for environmental protection purpose. I guess uh, the global trend now is that we are shifting towards a more environmentally, environmentally friendly, uh, like um, living lifestyle. Uh, but for now, I didn't really see like how COVID really uh, uh, initiated that. Yeah. I think in Korea, it's um, COVID and the need to digitalize and transform the economy to adapt better to the post-COVID era has um, stimulated discussion on the Korean New Deal. Um, it's, a, it's an economic slash, I guess, kind of a welfare policy that consists mainly of two elements, which is one, um, the digital New Deal, and the second is the Green New Deal. So the digital New Deal, um, it has to do with uh, digitalizing the economy um, helping companies better adapt to technological changes. And the Green New Deal, of course, um, has to do with uh, sustaining uh, environmentally friendly um, policies. And I think even though talks have existed even for COVID, I think COVID has been a great um, catalyst to push this forward. Don't know. I think you are not actually uh, only referring to um, so-called economic uh, sustainability. I, I guess uh, this is a much uh, bigger picture. So that's the reason why uh, like New Zealand talk about uh, welfare uh, budget, budgeting. The reason is uh, sometimes, for example, like our taxi driver, they can get uh, some small money from, uh, from like companies or from, from government, but mostly they want something to do because of they cannot actually just stuck at home. So in general, I would say that it's about in individual and also about very much um, like grassroots level uh, sustainability, not only about whether our economy can grow like by 2% or 3% of um, this kind of GDP. Thank you very much. Um, we have we have run out of time, unfortunately. So if, um, if I could just ask the panel if you have uh, very brief thoughts on uh, what people should watch out for right, um, in, in the coming months in terms, of, in terms of transiting to a kind of different COVID-19 strategy, what should we watch for? What would be interesting? Uh, what might be some of the stumbling blocks? Uh, any final thoughts uh, briefly from, from, from the panel? Maybe I'll just say this before somebody else says it. Uh, I think we should look at what you pay more attention to the metrics that uh, that governments and uh, we use. Uh, so we need better metrics than than case counts. I mean, case counts are a leading indicator, uh, 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 but probably what matters more would be our the ability of our healthcare systems to cope. Uh, so that's one. Obviously, vaccination, the vaccination rates would, would matter a lot. Third, I think a lot of our emphasis has been on, or a lot of our attention is given to vaccination, right? But increasingly, I think treatments, uh, treatments for those uh, people who do get symptoms, symptomatic COVID-19 patients, uh, treatments will matter a lot also. So, you know, to the extent that we can get better treatments uh, alongside, you know, highly effective vaccine, then that also aids in our transition to COVID endemic. Thanks, thanks, Donald. Uh, your point on treatment reminds me that we, we have almost completely neglected to mention Taiwan, where now treatment is a very hot topic because of the apparently very high death rates. Um, so people are looking at, is it the standard of treatment? What has gone wrong and, and so on? So yes, certainly we need to look beyond, I think, case counts. Uh, thanks, Donald. Uh, the others? Yeah, um, I guess uh, we have to remember that uh, like all policies are not standalone considerations. So uh, we have to consider like the whole uh, policy package we had, right, including population base or like case based policy that uh, affect what uh, like for example if we consider travel bubble, it's not just a certain policy that will affect that outcomes. Yeah, so it's uh, like the whole range of policy available. Thanks, Yilong. I 
think I'll, I'll just jump in on a very uh, minor thing. I think I think health education and uh, a lot of these policies are more visible in the public. But I think one one thing about which we might want to look out for are changes in laws. So, for instance, bankruptcy codes or like uh, say Singapore signing a lot of um, you know digital uh, transaction deals. So how to how to uh, regulate uh, digital uh, transactions across uh, uh, across countries, for instance. So I think these changes in laws might not be that visible, but I think they kind of uh, might set a new precedent or you know a new path on which uh, these regions might move. Yeah, thanks, Monish. New laws as a sign of new institutions. Huh? Okay. Uh, Soyang, anything? Um. I guess one thing to look out for is how governments are um, thinking of uh, old and new ways to um, kind of meet out uh, compensation payments. Um, Korea, I think, has already had uh, four rounds, maybe, of compensation payments to like small business owners. And I think it's important to look at not just the amount and the number of rounds of payments, but also how they are designed um, to benefit both the business owners and also the population, uh, also the, the consumers and what kind of sectors um, these are targeting. For example, you can um, like just compensate business owners, but you can also uh, give uh, vouchers to consumers so that they can spend um, while benefiting also small businesses. Yep. Thank you. Final thoughts, Alfred? I, I think government rely a lot uh, about um, policy learning from uh, good, practice, good, good practice in different regions, like, uh, uh, like uh, we, we learn a lot from each other. Uh, but in the meantime, government can do um, a better communication uh, to actually persuade people and also to uh, some time to educate people. But in the meantime, I would say that a very, very important thing is uh, um, COVID-19 actually uh, Western inequality, economic inequality, and also maybe uh, like emotional and also uh, health inequality. So I, I would think uh, policymakers need, need to emphasize uh, empathy and also compassion in policymaking. Mm. Thanks, Alfred. Just from that last round of final thoughts, I think we can see the whole range of policy making challenges uh, that we still have to contend with in the, in the coming months or possibly years. Um, with that, uh, our event has come to a close. Uh, for those of you who are interested to explore the tracker, as we mentioned, it's publicly accessible. Uh, the easiest way to get to it is to Google LKY SPP Social Inclusion Project. Um, the tracker is found on the main uh, main web page uh, for for this new research unit. So thank you uh, all very much on the panel uh, for sharing your thoughts uh, so candidly on a very difficult topic. I want to thank the audience as well for participating so actively and asking really good questions. I uh, hope everyone has a good evening and a fantastic weekend. Um, and please watch for future events from the LKY School. Thank you all very much.